get uh, feedback from and um, as you've just heard, we're now recording the meeting. So if you don't want to appear on the uh, video of this meeting, if you want to turn off your cameras so you're not visible on the YouTube, but obviously you can leave it on, but just to, to let you know that. And um, we're really delighted um, to have here um, two very important people. Um, first of all, we have uh, speaking Dr. Emar Brannigan. And uh, Dr. Browning is the clinical lead for the HSC antimicrobial resistance and infection control. So basically what that means is that she's the top dog in anything to do with infection control or um, diseases like that. Um, Emer is the lead on that and she, she's everybody goes uh, uh, to Dr. Browningham. Uh, she's a consultant in infectious diseases and general internal medicine and works in Beaumont Hospital. Um, and she's worked in this area for over 14 years, so a real expert in the area. And she's also very active in research as well. Um, so we're really delighted to have her here. And our other person, and I'll go through their bio in, in later on, is Professor George Malotti, who many of you will know as the National Clinical Lead um, in the National Renal Office, a consultant and nephrologist for both St. James's Hospital. And um, he has, uh, and Emer have been active throughout the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic. They were the ones who had to read up on all the materials which kept changing, making decisions which impacted on our lives and, you know, made a difference between people dying and, you know, people actually um, surviving. And as we well know from looking at other countries, you know, so many of those decisions were the right decisions. Um, so it's brilliant. And I really want to welcome you here for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules um, to actually um, come here and talk to us patients today and we really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to put together some materials you've looked at some of the questions that have been raised so i'm going to hand over to you now emer and you're going to kick off the session in terms of um uh, infection thanks very much carol for those words i hope you can hear me and indeed yeah that's great um it doesn't always feel like being top dog, but anyway, certainly I'm the person that people ask lots of questions of, and uh, I don't pretend I know all the answers, but I certainly try to answer them as best as I can. So, um, and you're right, it has been, um, my work of the last few years has really been focused on COVID, but, um, uh, but I suppose now we're trying to get back to not other than COVID. So including COVID perhaps is the way I should put it. Um, and you're right, the work of our team uh, grew out of work related to CPE, which will not be unfamiliar to some of you as well. Um, and our response to uh, managing that also very difficult multi-drug resistant uh, infection. Um, so what I propose to do is bearing in mind some of the questions that were sent to me maybe a week or two weeks ago, I've put together some sort of background slides, which may answer some of the questions that, that some of you will have. Uh, I don't suggest they'll answer all of them. And perhaps people might want to ask questions at a later point. Uh, Carol, I don't know how you want to run that, but that's, that's fine. So I'm gonna start with an overview of where we are with respect to respiratory viruses, if that's okay. So perhaps we might move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry, technology is just a little bit slow here. We'll get your next slide momentarily. Okay. And just to mention, you can put additional uh, questions into the chat function as well, just to remind you of that. So Carol has kind of already hinted at this, which is that perhaps it might be said that some of the world has moved on from this. Uh, people don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, but we're still dealing with it in healthcare and you're still dealing with it as a risk in your lives. And I think um, with that in mind, um, I think this, this is relevant commentary from the World Health Organization, which is, they say, based on current trends, the World Health Organization remains hopeful that by the end of this year, 2023, the COVID-19 emergency <laughs> can be ended worldwide. And so that's, not the whole story as we know 
um, it may be at some point this year or maybe next year that it just unmuting myself there again um, it may be decided that uh, it is no longer a pandemic but we are realizing and I think many people have predicted this that COVID isn't going to go away um, uh, really since it started to affect humans COVID has been constantly evolving and will continue to do so um, and we know now that um, while the virus in circulate the viruses I should say are in circulation now are not those that started out with our first exposure as humans um, to the virus in, in Wuhan in China it's much more infectious now but thankfully it's much less harmful on average to the hosts who are affected and we anticipate that this is likely to follow the pattern of other viruses that have come, been introduced into um, the human population would be living with it for a long time and so vaccination good infection control practices and awareness of risk and managing that risk are likely to be important uh, in how we reduce the spread of COVID-19 but actually are applicable to other respiratory viruses too next slide please um, now I'm not able to control background noises from other people, so just in case someone else can, uh, there, there is some background noise and apologies, I can't control that. Um, so this is some data from colleagues in the Health Protection Surveillance Centre and Today is the day when the newest data is made available. And so this is, in fact, the most recent data, just fresh off the presses <clears throat> about where we are with the three respiratory viruses that have caused us problems over the last six or eight weeks, and um, certainly in the healthcare, but also the population. And we've had an extraordinary influenza experience and an extraordinary RSV, respiratory syncytial virus experience. And to a lesser extent, we've had uh, a significant experience with COVID this past winter, but it really hasn't been anything like as, as significant as previous winters and also as those other two viruses. Um, and you can see that the data, these are numbers of hospitalized cases with those viruses with the dark blue representing COVID, the kind of greeny color in the middle representing influenza and the red color representing RSV. And um, you can see that all of those numbers, although they've bumped around in the last couple of weeks, really there is now a downward trend for all three viruses consistently over the last three weeks. And as I say, today's data hot off the presses confirm that that's the case for hospitalizations with, with these infections. And although that's great news, it doesn't mean they've gone away. So just to be uh, give a, a, a balanced view of that, it's good news, but they haven't gone away. We're still in flu season very much. I would have to say COVID is still in circulation. RSV is likely to dwindle very quickly now and no longer be an issue, but the other two will probably remain for a number of weeks. Next slide, please. And this is showing the impact of COVID in isolation now, COVID and its impact on the population as a whole. And again, you can see that peak, which was in December and into January, and now again, falling off across all age groups. Next slide, please. Again, latest data showing um, that same trend, which has been really a remarkable season for influenza, um, reached an enormous peak that we've really never seen before. Admittedly, there's been much more testing than there would have been in previous years. Um, but even if you look at the hospitalized cases, it's been significantly more than previous experiences of, of flus over recent years. But again, the good news, it's fallen away quite precipitously. Um, and we're pleased to see that, but we're still in flu season. Thank you for moving on. RSV also similar pattern. And as I say, colleagues are likely to stop reporting this soon because it, 
we really come out of RSV season quite quickly now. Thank you. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that was asked in advance was about treatment options. And this is not great news, really. There isn't, uh, there aren't many options for pre-hospital patients or patients who don't need hospital um, as a result of their COVID. This is COVID specifically now, this is not influenza. Uh, and this is a, an infographic from the um, group that uh, advises uh, the therapeutic guidance. Um, and this is the current state of play, which is that for pre-hospitalized patients, um, in other words, people who don't need oxygen, um, and aren't in respiratory distress, there really are only two options. And the evidence for, for both of these is fairly limited um, in terms of their benefits. And they both have significant challenges with actually um, accessing them. Paxlovid, some of you will be aware of, uh, is contraindicated. In other words, it should not be used in, in patients who have significant uh, renal impairment. Um, and also has significant interactions. So for, for those of you who are transplant recipients, that is incredibly difficult. Um, and I, I anticipate is not used in those, um, in those patients, in such patients. Similarly, well, not similarly, but similarly challenging is remdesivir. Remdesivir is not available as an oral treatment and it's a three-day course of intravenous treatment. And therefore that logistically provides a number of challenges to actually access. And as I said, it's not that either of these is a magic bullet remedy. Uh, they do show some benefit in some patients, but as I say, they're not, um, the evidence is not strong. The strongest evidence, in fact, is for the treatment of hospitalized patients in which there is good evidence that the use of um, thrombus prophylaxis, uh, steroids, and in some cases who are rapidly deteriorating, a monoclonal antibody called tocilizumab. So not a great picture. And um, I haven't put on this uh, citrovimab because that's been recommended against now. That was a monoclonal antibody that was um, in use for a time, uh, but was then shown to no longer have efficacy against um, the Omicron variants. And uh, and, and that is the state of play at the moment for those. And, and I know other, also people were asking about Evisheld. Um, so we might talk about Evisheld in a moment. Next slide, please. Um, and this is about um, outbreaks in healthcare settings. So again, people were asking among the early questions about concerns about accessing healthcare because there was transmission within those settings. And that is true. There have been outbreaks of um, COVID and influenza and respiratory syncytial virus infection in those settings. Um, and they follow a pattern that very much follows that seen in the community of a peak in this past winter season um, and now falling off. Uh, and this is very challenging. Um, and so it's important to be aware of this risk and to be able to mitigate it where that's possible. Next slide, please. So that's a kind of a bit of um, clinical background and um, updates with uh, some data hot off the presses. I'm now going to slightly change direction and give you some um, findings from the latest uh, bit of research on public opinion and feedback about um, how people are feeling about COVID and the information that's coming out to people about keeping safe and general attitudes to those preventive measures. And the most piece, recent piece of research was done in December, uh, 1500 people in the Republic of Ireland and a representative snapshot of opinion. And it's been compared against two previous similar bits of research um, six months apart prior to that. Next slide, please. And these are the sort of data that we can see here, which is reassuring that many people are still cautious about COVID and flu. However, people are generally feeling more optimistic 
and a little more relaxed than in the summer last year. Um, and feelings of being fed up or frustrated have decreased since that period, um, which corresponds to a general um, relaxation of restrictions uh, in public. Next slide, please. Um, so people were asked about some of the protective behaviors, getting a vaccine, giving people space, um, respiratory etiquette, um, and so forth, covering coughs and sneezes, hand hygiene. And you can see here uh, displayed that many are continuing to practice these protective behaviors. Um, and there's been an increase in hand washing, something we've been advocating for many years for various other reasons. Um, uh, and we hope that that will continue. Um, next slide, please. Some of the things that people were asked about, however, people are uh, feeling less um, keen on continuing to do, um, or they're telling us that we're do they're doing that less. So they're no longer checking, for example, that visitors have symptoms before they attend their home or visit with them. They're not airing the room. Uh, they're not meeting up uh, outdoors where possible. Uh, and you can see a few other things there, wearing masks and so forth. So those are, uh, those may be concerns to some of you that that is the general approach to um, some of those protective behaviors. Next slide, please. However, we do have information that those in high risk households are more likely to protect, practice those protective behaviors. And that's not a surprise. We know that where people are aware of a risk, they're more likely to take action to reduce that risk. And so you can see that on this slide, the high risk households being in the paler color. Next slide, please. And next slide again. So this is just so you see what the new um, advice looks like. And hopefully some of you have seen this, um, setting out the most recent campaign um, for the uh, general public and information about who's at higher risk and advice for keeping well, which reiterates that those preventive protective measures are continue to be important. Um, protecting yourself day to day, wear a mask, especially in crowded areas, clean your hands and let fresh air into your homes. Uh, and there's some of those other points that were mentioned on those um, slides are reiterated here. So hopefully you have seen this and if you haven't, hopefully you will see it now that you've been primed to look out for it. Next slide, please. And so really what I'd encourage you all to do is to not think of any one of these as being the thing that will protect you, but think about them as being layered um, steps, and layered protections, um, staying home if you're unwell, um, checking in with your GP if you need to have a test, um, and discouraging visitors who are unwell, and cleaning your hands, wearing a mask when you're around uh, crowded areas or busy spaces, uh, keeping up to date with your vaccines, and um, uh, if you're not uh, if you're not comfortable in the area that you're in, moving away from that space. I think that's my last slide. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions, um, but we'll take Professor Malati's talk um, next and um, then we'll, uh, Colin will facilitate uh, questions. So um, many of you will know uh, Professor uh, Malati as he is a, a nephrologist. Um, he is the clinical lead. So again, another top dog. Uh, even though he probably feels like he's not a top dog given the amount of work that he, he has to carry. Um, but he's been a good friend to the Irish Kidney Association, has been um, really involved. Uh, you know, we did a, a Zoom last year with us on World Kidney Day and helped us to raise, raise awareness of kidney disease. And I'm hoping you'll do the same again this year. I've got to ask you, uh, Professor, uh, last time we were chatting. And he also um, is a practicing uh, consultant in Tallaght and St. James's, and he does, is a huge fan of home dialysis. And um, he, he has a lot of research interests as well, and is also a trustee with the Irish Nephrology Society as well, which is the group of healthcare um, consultants in kidney disease who come together and continuously advocate to improve services um, for patients with kidney disease. So over to you now, Professor. Okay. 
Thank you, Carl. And um, what I'm really going to talk about is maybe go back in history a little bit and talk what it did for us and what we did in response and where we see ourselves going. Um, do we have our first slide, please? I think we all have memories of seeing Tony Houlton and his, and his sidekicks and the 29th of February was the first case in Ireland. And the news was quite frightening, particularly for a lot of people. And can I have the next slide, please? Because we discovered very early during the COVID pandemic that dialysis and kidney transplant patients were deemed to be extremely vulnerable. They had a higher than average risk of getting extremely sick and even dying. And that was reported in other countries. And particularly hemodialysis patients had high infection rates because they couldn't isolate. They were going in and out of hospital three times per week. And the patients were genuinely afraid of you know, getting COVID from other patients and other staff and bringing that COVID home to their homes and their communities and with all the consequent risks. For ourselves as doctors, we were particularly worried because we found that one in four patients who were in ICU needed dialysis. It's a huge demand for dialysis, both in the ICU and when they're leaving ICU. And I think everybody was worried about that time and would there be enough stuff? And we were very lucky. We, you know, we got into the HSE very quickly to argue our case. Next slide, please. So we went straight in. You know, I think I was in within two weeks and I said, this is going to be a problem. If you don't do something, we need to have that increased dialysis capacity. One, to cope with the expected demand in ICU care. The second was that people who on dialysis who got COVID needed to be isolated from those who didn't have COVID. So we had to get extra dialysis machines, extra ICU support and extra isolation rooms. And we went out very, very quickly and went shopping. We bought infrastructure that is still there, additional uh, what's called RO machines so we can have isolation rooms throughout all the hospitals because some hospitals had very little isolation capacity. Extra dialysis machines in case the ICU needed more capacity. And we put we asked people to move to the satellite contracted units and asked to put on extra shifts, employ extra staff and be flexible. And that was done. Next slide, please. And one of the things that hit very quickly was transplantation had to be suspended. It was deemed deemed very serious and people who got transplants were extremely vulnerable and ICU beds weren't made available for for donors, um, non-heart beating donors. So the, the, the supply of kidneys stopped and the surgeons weren't able to operate. And what we feared did happen. There's a shortage of machines and equipment worldwide, particularly in London, particularly in, in France, Madrid, or in certain states in America. You know, and you can see there the headlines of the time from the New York Times, from the English Times. But our we, we were lucky. We got our contingency in and we kept going. Next slide, please. And I, I've really got to thank Martin Cormick and, and Amrick and some of the people working with them at that time. Martin was the lead just before Emer, and he listened to us very, very quickly. Um, we issued guidance to the renal units on the 16th of March. We sent them out to the IKA with, with patients and we kept on being updated. We kept getting policy reviews and as new evidence, new treatments, new vaccines, new isolation, these kept on being evolved. And I cannot thank Amrick and all the people working there for their expertise because this was something, you know, this was never on the curriculum in the medical school. I can tell you that. Next slide, please. We also got support for enhanced infection control policies, the self-drive stipend, the, the new taxi protocols. We got, you know, we made for social distancing and we started watching what was going on. We managed at the time to have a national surveillance for COVID-19 to look at what was going on. Next slide, please. And despite a national lockdown, which was, as you all remember, that famous St. Paddy's Day, you know, um, we celebrate St. Paddy's Day like no other. Even though the patients were isolating, it was still getting new cases of COVID every week. And our patients, you, our patients were getting sicker 
and some people passed away. And we looked and I looked and I can thank Google Translate for some of the advice I got from Italy. Next slide, please. Keep going. Okay. I got a lot of grief over this by putting in mandatory surgical mask wearing. We arranged for surgical masks for patient use, which was extremely hard at the time because it was very hard to get surgical masks, but we got them for our renal, everybody on in center dialysis. You had to wear it to and from dialysis and constantly during dialysis. Now that was controversial, but that was based on good research from Northern Italy. And um, it was tough. You know, you and I fully understood what patients had to go through four hours of dialysis and maybe an hour trans going in and going out. We gave digital thermometers to all hemodialysis patients and to keep alert going. Next slide. But it worked. And I think I'm, if I'm that I'm proud of was this, I would after two weeks with a 90% decrease in COVID-19 incidence. And unique in Europe, we had no new case in hemodialysis patients for over four months. And you can see that slide. I don't know whether I can, I can't, maybe I can. You saw its level. And then we relaxed it in June to avoid malnutrition. And when we got the second wave, we put it back in. And you can see the green dropped almost immediately once we put it back in again after two weeks. Now, unfortunately, we lost our IT specialist, so we couldn't do it any further than that. We re this research was published and got into a lot of other international policies. And for you, the dialysis patient, you are much less likely to get severe illness and die because you're low risk of infection. So right. from that, we were pleased. Okay, next slide, please. Again, we worked with American HSC and to get the CKD patients, you know, identified as being extremely vulnerable and to get prioritized for early vaccination, extended primary vaccination and second booster doses. That has really improved the patient outcome. We know as clinicians on the wards that the vaccine was proving effective. One thing that became quite clear in our research was that patients who were on dialysis or patients with transplants didn't respond as well to the first and second. That's why they needed three doses for the primary vaccination. It didn't last as long, so they had to get a second booster a first booster, then a second booster, and they're now being prioritized for a third booster to maintain the response. So, and we might talk about that later. Next slide, please. The good outcome we saw in Ireland wouldn't have occurred without the help of several specific groups of people. And I really want to thank the patients. Many of you agreed to move units, change your dialysis schedules to accommodate other patients, agreed to out of hours dialysis schedules, gave up eating on dialysis, accepted that you couldn't talk to the nurses, couldn't have said that friendly chat and that or the doctors weren't around because they're going places. But, you know, we made conscious efforts and maybe only see patients when we had to see patients because we were going from the infected wards to the other wards. And <clears throat> we made deliberate decisions. If you're on the, inf like in our own unit, if you were d working on the A&E and covering the COVID, you weren't going to go on the dialysis ward. And I would cover people on the dialysis ward and we swapped around so that you weren't getting patients the doctors weren't going from casualty down to dialysis so we split teams into a's and b's and c's and you accepted all that you took on self-drive to dialysis next slide please i've got to thank my colleagues i mean the restrictions opposed by pbe especially during the you know when you're wearing those those high HP duck bill masks, they're uncomfortable. And some of our ICU staff staff wearing them for hours at a time. Their staff took on additional duties. They extended their working days. They did out of our schedules. At one stage, I remember in Tala, we were doing dialysis way into the night because we had no capacity. You know, we, they went into ICU, went into the isolation rooms. They accepted that there was no secretary to do all the administrative work. You couldn't get to see us. You couldn't get to see our nursing colleagues. They all, you know, people had to change and they accepted that. Next slide, please. But I really want to thank what I call the unsung heroes. The drivers who drove patients into dialysis, knowing that some of these could have a COVID and they were high risk patients, knowing that this was a risk. 
family members and taxi drivers. That word cocoon, which we've nearly all forgotten. But we had a lot of helpers who helped a lot of our vulnerable patients to do their shopping, to bring their medications to them, to organize those patients on home dialysis with the dialysis flutes and equipment storage. Another success story, that I wasn't notified, and I could be wrong, but no of our home dialysis therapy patients you know, got severe COVID. You know, so that's really good. Some got COVID, but nobody got severe COVID. Next slide, please. It does, it remains a clinical risk. Patients, particularly dialysis and transplant patients, can get ill with secondary infections. The vaccines have made a big difference, and we, but we're still urging caution, which you heard before, the hand hygiene, the flu vaccine, and you will hear about the third additional booster. Next slide, please. The current picture. Hmm. Keep going. Sorry. All right, Something George. Like there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. This might be slow. Okay, fine. These slides have changed. Um, there's ongoing growth and demand for dialysis treatment. We've seen that the figures you saw published there at the beginning of the year, we've 134, 134 yeah, extra people on dialysis compared to the year before. No, a box of dairy milk, box of chocolates. There's something inside Mark and went to it. Sheena, okay. All right. We have pre-COVID, and we want, we've tracked the prevalence of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease for over 13 years now in the National Renal Office. Before COVID, 60% of the growth was in transplant and 40% was in dialysis. I'm sad to say that since COVID, the, yeah. growth, is, the growth has been primarily in dialysis numbers and transplant activity has not yet got back to normal. It will, I'm sure it will, but we have to deal with an aging population, people living longer and healthier. So we're going to have to invest in additional units around the country to cope with increased demand. And we all are going to have to embrace new technologies, looking at virtual appointments, bringing people. Sorry, we're still getting a bit of. Could you please mute your microphone? Sorry. Next slide, please. Oh, there's a sli okay, there's a slide gone someplace. Um, I think there's a slide in the in, in the in the middle. Well, I'll leave it there for the time being. Um I'm trying to think of what slide sorry, Colin. I'm just you reformatted my slides and I'm just missing a slide and I just want to check which slide it was on my own computer. Okay. Apologies for that. Um have a look. Okay, it was the current. It was the current picture slide, and I, um, because one of the, that's the slide that that I think it might it might have gone into white. Okay, um, see, can I share this particular um? Okay, where are we now? Can I just see? Can I uh, share screen? Um, see, can I share? Just I just want to share one slide. This is the one that disappeared. Um, yeah, we can see okay, that, George. Okay. The one slide I, and I ask is that we've seen a number of patients who've lost kidney function as a result of COVID-19. This, dam you know, this damage, fortunately, is not progressive, but a lot of people may have experienced it. It was definitely more common with the first wave, particularly those who were sick, and particularly in those who needed ICU or dialysis in hospital. Um, and, but it did occur in some people who weren't even sick, you know, but a lot less, and they lost a certain amount of kidney function. Um, and this can have serious you know, implications. If it's someone with, who's got a no, relatively normal kidney function, a GFR of, you know, of 65 and it goes to 61, that's not going to cause any clinical problems. Even if it's 45 and it goes to 41, it's not a real problem. But if you are got a GFR of 16 and it, and it goes down to 12 or 11, 
that does have implications. Again, I'm pretty much, we've seen this pretty much with the first wave. We're not seeing it like it was, but I, I, that's one of the reasons I'm still being a little bit cautious and advising people to be careful and explain some things that went on. Okay, I'm going to stop at that and um, we'll take, up, take from there. Great, thanks very uh, much, George, and apologies for the, the technical difficulties. And again, I'd ask people um, to mute their microphones again. I had, had muted some, but some people seem to have become unmuted again. Um, and we have a number of questions. And again, you can put your questions into the chat function um, if you have any more questions. So I'm going to hand over to Colin now, who has a number of questions that he's going to ask uh, that have been previously submitted. Right, um, George, I'm afraid you're on the, the, the hotspot to start off here. Right. Um, a few people have been asking why they can't get their COVID boosters in the dialysis unit. Why do they have to go to public centres or their GP? Well, I think that's a national policy decision regarding the, um, the vaccination process. Um, it, it, in the in the first phase we did it, but after that, the decision that all the vaccination would it was you know is not happening in the hospital. Um, it's just it's national policy, um, and that's the reason why. I would I would just say anecdotally from uh, comments we've got in the kidney association, it's one of the reasons why the uptake amongst people on dialysis isn't as high as it could be is it's a bit more inconvenient to to get out or, or risk yeah. risky, as some people might say. Um, dialysis transport, lots of questions. Um, taxi drivers not wearing masks, is it mandatory that they should? No. Nope. It's not it's not a mandatory requirement that they wear masks. Um, you know, this and I know where, where people are coming. I mean, it's been blue. Brutally honest, it's complete. It's, you know the the track, the taxi transport. It was extremely, extremely expensive during COVID. It was a necessary. It was a necessary requirement. It you know it's unsustainable, and the fear would be in, in my own fear would be that if we argue for you know you might you know be careful what you wish for. You might be told either you know everyone has to drive and we can't get taxi transport. You know it, so look, um, we looked at that. We talked to Emer. We talked to Martin. This has been discussed in detail. Um, it's not a mandatory requirement for taxi drivers, and um, taxi sharing has been looked at. So the research has been looked at, and sharing has been authorised. Um, right. Pick up on a on a, on a couple of points there. The mileage allowance for the self drive. Um, is yep. that going to continue? We were told it was a temporary COVID measure. Can we rely on its continuance? Well, uh, as the fellow says, I've had, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. I, we, we grabbed that at the time. I was actually only in with the hospitals yesterday. I'm arguing very strongly that it should be reconfigured and it should be linked to HSE mileage rates because, it, you know, it is saving the HSE money. I will agree with you on that. Um, and I think it should be linked. If it's good, if the HSE are paying their own staff that and if, and if they pay patients, which they do to attend, you know, patient orientated meetings and give them mileage for that. You know, the problem I think the HSE is a little bit worried about is precedent. If they give it to one group, will the next group jump up and look at it? But the dialysis patients are unique. They're the only group that have to attend the hospital 156 times a year and have to arrive every time on time. You know, you can't be late for your dialysis session. So that's why you know, patient transport. As I said, I've been arguing with it. I've been in three times this year, well, sorry, three times in the last four months talking to the various heads of departments to try and get this across the line. And I'm committed. You know, I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be like a man in the Shawshank Redemption. Keep on writing a letter. Keep on arguing the point. I feel very strongly that it should be continued on a permanent basis. And I will try my best for, for our patients to get that. Excellent. Um, good comment there came up in the chat that connects to a couple more of the questions in relation again to the mask wearing um, in taxis. Um, should the patients be kind of looking to the N95 masks or are the like the normal surgical masks, which which would you recommend? 
I pass that over to Emer. We actually have provided both sets of masks to um to, for the for the for for dialysis patients. That was provided for um, but I let Emer talk about that because um, she's more of an expert in this than I am. Yeah, um, I think most of our guidance suggests that at the minute, um where masks are provided, that there should be options provided for people's preferences, really. I think um, I know an FFP2 mask or an N95 or those higher level filtration masks certainly make people feel more comfortable. Um, there has been a, a publication, I think towards the end of last year, um, it wasn't about this particular setting, but it was comparing the use of N95 versus surgical masks. And there wasn't a whole lot of difference in terms of protection. And the reason for that is probably to do with how they're actually used as opposed to how they're intended to be used. And so in the real world, there probably isn't much difference between the two because people don't wear them in the way that they're intended. And um, they don't wear them perfectly or ideally, they're not properly fitted for a particular person's shape of face and all the rest of it. But um, so I think, I think the answer is, if they're being provided, a choice should be provided and people should be able to access one that they're comfortable wearing. Um, I suppose if you're gonna wear a mask, you should wear one that does feel comfortable because that probably means it's um, fitting reasonably well and um, probably providing both a barrier as well as filtration. Um, obviously a high filtration mask will provide more filtration as well as barrier and a surgical mask won't provide filtration really at all. Um, it's really a barrier against inhalation of um, larger respiratory particles. And of course has gaps around the sides, top and bottom and so forth, um, it, depending on the, the fit and material of the mask. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose that's what I would say. So a, a lot of it really is um, whoever we are, uh, whatever our health status, it's how we wear the mask is almost as important as what type of mask we wear. Yeah, I think I think using the idea of something that fits snugly is probably like it doesn't need to fit incredibly tightly, but it just needs mm. to fit snugly, flush with the face as much as possible. Um, and, you know, over time, I suspect you've all found your favorite brand. Um, you've all found one that works for you works for your shape of face. You know, we some of us have longer faces, broader faces, bigger jaws, bigger noses, smaller noses, and all of those make a difference to the fit of the particular mask, be it a surgical mask or, or um, one of the filtration masks. Right, George, a question just came up in the chat there that bounces this one back into your court. Um, are the dialysis units supposed to be kind of providing these masks for um, both the dialysis session and I guess for the taxi transport as well, should they still be providing them? Um, from, from what I understand, the, the HSE have been providing them to, to the hospitals and I haven't heard anything contrary to that. In actual fact, saying that we did get a, a request from some unit to say, will you stop sending them to us because we have so many. So, um, and I know in our own hospital, any of the hospitals, there's just they just leave out boxes of masks for people as they walk in the door to put on as you're coming in, and there's free access to masks. So I can't, I I don't know what's happening in individual hospitals. I just I haven't gone around to to visit them. So, but we uh, we as an NRO organize that there will be a, a delivery to all hemodialysis units of masks every week. If some units are not taking them up, I don't know I don't know why because it is being provided by the by the HSE to the dialysis units and they've been doing that since the uh, since April 2020. We were one of the first units to actually insist on mask wearing well before it became popular. Grant, um, just one final transport question. If an individual feels that they're particularly vulnerable, can they make a case for uh, single person transport to and from? Um, well, I think this single, you know, if there is a, a clinical reason that the clinician themselves feel that there is, um, there may there may be some leeway. But I mean, I not sure about that. But uh, most people. I would say it's a feeling rather than a clinical need because most people are no, and I I I'll defer to Emer in this respect. But I, you know, most people on dialysis, you know, are not that 
immunocompromised with the with the viruses that they need to be completely isolated. But Emer, I'll let you give the definitive advice on that. Yeah, I, th I think I'd agree with that. I mean, I, I, I imagine like most things that the in healthcare, and perhaps I'm naive, but there's a discussion between the patient and their clinician to make a decision about something like that. But I, I, I agree with George's assessment of the degree of immunocompromised. There may be people who are very particularly immunocompromised, but that's not the generality. I suppose if people genuinely are in that significant degree of immunocompromised, I think that's a reasonable discussion with their clinician and they can either, you know, they can figure out whether that is something that's essential. Remember that the risks in the transport are all things that can be reduced. I think it's important to be aware of the risk and also to reduce the risk. And that's true whether it's in transport or in some other setting. So, you know, the numbers of people there, um, masks or not masks, airing the place or not airing the place, um, and making sure that you're up to date with your vaccines where that's relevant to you. So I think, and, and ensuring that you aren't symptomatic as you're traveling, so you're not putting other people at risk, um, and therefore everyone else is doing the same thing, that there's nobody symptomatic in the vehicle. And um, there are ways to reduce those risks, but again, as I say, I hope I'm not being naive. I presume there's a, an ability of somebody who is incredibly medically vulnerable to have that discussion with the clinician and make a decision and come to a plan. And just on, on that front about kind of ventilation and all of that, um, George, in the dialysis units or equally in the hospitals from going for clinic, um, has there been or will there be a COVID legacy in relation to kind of better ventilation or um, kind of particularly managing people who are immune compromised, like one we're regularly getting in the office now much more than we ever did pre-COVID is um, accessing hospital services via the emergency department and the um, like the, the 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 recent crisis, like the thoughts of having to wait in there for many hours when you're medically vulnerable, people are avoiding going, and like the 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 impact of that is not good. So, is there any any kind of legacy you think might might come? Personally, I think there is probably a need to upgrade. You know, over the next few years, to upgrade our isolation facilities, upgrade our you know, and that you know we started that. As a temporary measure during um, during COVID, we managed to get more isolation rooms put in the reverse osmosis. But person uh, personally, I think over the next years there will have to be an investment from the HSE into building its infrastructure. And I think it's not just it's not just in dialysis units, but probably in all places. Um, I, we have learned an awful lot out of COVID. Um, I, you know, like even doctors ourselves. I mean. I, I, you know, I've never worn scrubs as often and I'm never so happy to wear scrubs. I never wore scrubs before COVID came. Now I would never think about going to the wars unless, and, and, you know, bare below. There's, a, there's been a mindset change among doctors, among nurses, among everybody. And I think it's going to, it's going to keep going. And, it's, and I think there is a process, but there will be a need for capital investment. But um, it's, there's no quick fix. And I think well, we will have to change and look how we do things. And, you know, will we all have six better Nightingale wards? And, you know, <laughs> Emer, you can you can tell us how we're going to do it all at, at no cost. Yeah, oh, I can't. Oh, I can't do that. For sure. I can't do that. And in fact, I mean, it's probably worth saying that. Um, after the or as part of the PPE, which I mentioned yeah. earlier, um, Martin, who you mentioned earlier, Martin Cormack and my predecessor and colleagues in HSE Estates, have done a desktop, a desktop exercise of what would be needed in healthcare facilities to get to, and, and they only selected certain aspects of, of what's recommended in, in ideal building regulations. But if you think on top, and that, the, the cost of that was going to be enormous, and the Department of Health is aware of that enormous cost and has been told about it on multiple occasions, as is the HSE, et cetera, et cetera. But that was only some of the aspects. And if you build on top of that, what we've learned from COVID, and I would say um, to your point, Colin, about ventilation, should there be a legacy? Of course there should be. Will there be? Who knows? But we've continued to advocate for several elements of what we should be doing ideally in buildings. 
regulations, which is not only to do with ventilation, but also spacing. You mentioned nightingale wards, George. I mean, there shouldn't be nightingale wards anywhere anymore, but there are, and that takes time and money and investment to, to change. And you know, our, our guidance for what a new build should look like is that it should be predominantly single rooms, and there may be the need for some small number of two bedded wards. I mean, that is so far from where we are with most healthcare facilities. And um, obviously the new shiny unit in George's care uh, accepted. But you know, th there are many units across the country and in particular in a winter surge like we just experienced, there's ab it's absolute pie in the sky to expect to achieve you know, one meter between individuals in the corridor in an emergency department. So I completely, I completely hear that that is a, an enormous challenge and the cost of the work pre-COVID, the desktop exercise to understand what was needed at that stage was enormous. I can only imagine it's bigger now um, in order to achieve that. But you know, we engage regularly, the AMRIC team engages regularly with our estates colleagues to talk about what work is coming up to make sure that there is infection control expertise input into that to make sure it meets as best within the constraints of, of the funding for that project what is um, appropriate and, and I would and we are constantly advocating for for optimal ventilation. I suppose the other thing to say is um, there has been some pilot work about uh, you know let's say that we're accepting that not accepting but but understanding as a common idea that ventilation isn't ideal in many places. So what about the idea of these standalone HEPA units, HEPA filtration units? We funded a pilot in one of the acute um, hospitals and um, I mean again it's a bit about you know the unit might do very well in ideal circumstances but if you put it in a busy ward and um, the actual real world benefits of it are difficult to quantify and in fact it may they may not be helpful so so we're trying to learn a little bit about what the technologies are that are out there to see if we can um, amplify what is currently you know the infrastructure that we're working in um, but the answers aren't straightforward um, but I would hope that we continue to work towards that legacy in respect to our buildings I hope that helps a little um George do you think or have you seen a, a move towards uh, home dialysis and like let's say people are now kind of Christmas is out of the way and they're thinking no, I, I, I want to move towards this home dialysis. Like, is, is there the opportunity or have you seen people grab the opportunity already to, to change treatment? Well, I mean, the figures there show that we have seen a very large increase in the number of patients on dialysis, on home therapies over the last, over the last um, two years. I mean, prior to COVID, we had less than 200 people on home hemodialysis. We now have 245. Last year was a little bit disappointing. There was no extra patients um, starting home, home dialysis. And some of that is, is to do with nursing resources. We're you know, getting difficult to get nurses. And I was very glad to have a very successful year with the HSC and managed to get 220 extra additional staffing into Renla, which a lot of them will be advanced nurse practitioners, will be additional nurses, counsellors, medical social workers, dietitians who can help. But and I you know there's other things I've gone in. I'm still I'm still looking and I'd love to get an assisted personal dialysis program be, you know because but the problem is some of these come from different budgets. I mean someone needs assisted PD and that has to come from the hospital budget or get somebody employed. But if they get a home help to look after them when they come home from dialysis, that comes from the community. You know, and we need to try and get some joined up thinking. Um, and that's where we're looking at. And, you know, and the advocacy of the IK is very good in that respect. I mean, I think most doctors, if they were sick, would prefer to be on home dialysis. You have less risk of infection. and You have more control over your life and it can be tailored. And I mean, we do a lot in, a, in our own unit of incremental home dialysis where you do PD for seven days, six days a week, or even five days a week. So you have time off rather than the textbook seven days as you start off, or you do three exchanges rather than four, or you look at the quality of life. So I do think going forward, we need to look at how can we deliver assisted personal dialysis and assisted home hemodialysis. Can we get more people in training? And you know that's where I'm looking at because that's less infections and a less of a capital of a capital thing. So that's what we 
we would look at. No, oh, very good. Um, now uh, let's look at the transplant recipients. In terms of treatment options, um, we heard during the pandemic that like people who were within their first year post transplant were um, at kind of a higher risk than somebody who was maybe five, 10 years down the line. Are there different treatment options or is it just everybody should be cautious and everybody follows route one or, or, or what's the situation? Amor, do you want to take that? Or will I take it? Well, I, I would say everybody should be cautious, but I don't know if there's a nuance around the actual degree of immunocompromise. That might be more your um, bailiwick, George. But uh, I think still think everyone should be cautious, regardless of what their actual risk is. Um, so I'll leave that to George. Um, cert certainly during the first year post-transplant, you're more heavily immunosuppressed. You're on higher dose of drugs, you particularly your prograft level is running a bit higher. You may have had higher dose of steroids. So yes, you've got to be more cautious. Um, and that's natural. The other risk is that you're going into the hospital more often. That's why I was very pleased to support the Beaumont transplant app. So to minimize transplant visits, we one of the things we did during COVID, which I forgot to mention, was we provide 24 hour BPs machines so that people wouldn't have to could get the blood pressure checked at home rather than coming into hospital and minimize clinic visits and doing practical things like this to have more virtual visits um but your immune system reconstitutes after a while and immunosuppression reduces af after six months but i still think all these patients are vulnerable they're not as vulnerable as they were because the the vaccines do what they say in the tin and the disease and COVID itself has become a milder illness um, it, that's a definite, but we are seeing some patients that got sick and occasionally we have tragedies and people, as we mentioned, you know, um, get COVID and don't pull through. Um, fortunately, it's extremely rare and some people who are extremely sick still pull through. Sorry a second, I just go, go yeah. Sorry. We've had, um, another, another 20 minutes. Somebody's echoing. Um, We've had some reading about, um, like, should there be changes in the level of immunosuppression when somebody's being treated for COVID? Um, that has been some research done internationally. Um, have there been any kind of concrete findings in relation to that? This was very topical, particularly during the first wave. Um, and I remember being, being on a few, a few of these virtual conferences and people were arguing you should and you shouldn't. <laughs> Um, and a, a part of it is, I think, the severity of the illness. Um, and we do this not just for COVID, but for any severe infection. When people are severely, extremely unwell and septicemic and at risk of dying from sepsis, we would always reduce the immunosuppression, even COVID or no <clears> COVID, <throat> simply to try and say, well, look, at, you know, it's better to survive and have a kid I have a failed kidney transplant than not, sur than not survive at all. I and I've done this myself personally. Ironically, I also say when people are so sick fighting an infection, they're too sick to reject a kidney. And that's, that happens as well. So when people were, particularly in the first wave, were extremely ill with COVID, occasional immunosuppression was reduced. In the second and third waves, there was no benefit seen in reducing immunosuppression. And the consensus talking to, to um, Dr. McGee and some of my colleagues in Beaumont in particular, who will be the, the leaders in this, is that they don't routinely reduce immunosuppression anymore because the illness is not, I mean, that's not to say that in certain specific circumstances, they feel it's the right thing to do, say if there's a secondary infection, but not for ordinary, what I would call mild to moderate COVID. Does that answer the question and make sense? Does, I think, yeah, thank you. Um, gosh, we're, we're rattling our way through here now. Um, in terms of treatment and testing, um, here's one. I've had a positive antigen test at home. What should I do next? That one if you want, George. Pardon? I can take that one if you want. Yeah, you take that one, yeah. Um, well, it's the... the the stock answer, of course, is that um, 
you need to stay home and liaise with a healthcare provider in order to figure out whether you might benefit from some treatment. The challenge is, of course, for patients with significant renal impairment or transplant recipients, because actually there weren't particularly treatment options available. Um, I would still advocate for liaising with your healthcare provider because there may be things that it would be worth assessing even remotely, um, in other words, by phone or whatever. Mm. Uh, and it may be to alert you that you need to have these criteria that would make you blue light yourself in to get some uh, inpatient care. Uh, you know, what are the things that would, um, that they would advise you to, to get you into hospital so that you would need, for example, steroids or thromboprophylaxis and oxygen and so forth. Um, George, would I be correct in saying that um, whether you're transplanted or on dialysis and you feel you have COVID, um, your renal team should be one of your first phone calls? Absolutely. Absolutely. Particularly, particularly for dialysis patients, because, you know, we need to know if you are COVID positive, you come in on a separate route into your dialysis treatment. Like, um, you know, one of, the glad, one of the things I'm really proud of is that we were able to open our bartery unit and we had six isolation rooms with an, a separate entrance for our patients, which Emer would probably <laughs> die for, but our patients yes. come, in, come in on a separate entrance. And this is based on best practice. And, but the same as other places, we put in extra isolation rooms. So if you're on dialysis and you think you might have COVID, even if you haven't got a test, even thinking you've got COVID, we need to know, tell us, because you need to go in a separate path. We bring you in in a separate path, get your dialysis, just to protect you, but also to protect the other patients. So we need to know, and this, but most dialysis patients know this is drilled into them. The transplants, we need to know, because it may be appropriate to give you extra steroids, because everybody's on steroids. And when you're sick with COVID, you might need extra steroids. We may need to look at some of your immunosuppressive drugs. So let us know <laughs> and let us make those decisions. I have a motto I have for my junior doctors, and I apply to everybody. I'd much to prefer to get a stupid phone call than hear about a stupid mistake. That's my motto. So I tell them, ring me anytime, because I much prefer to get a stupid phone call than hear about a stupid mistake. And that's the motto, you know, all doctors adhere to. Mm. Now, um, when it comes to the vaccinations and the boosters, um, we're hearing various reasons why uptake is not maybe as high as, as we would think. Some people are having kind of a negative experience of one particular brand of, of vaccine. Like we've regularly had phone calls um, in, our, in our office where I'm certainly not taking brand X ever again. I felt so horrible after it. And they're kind of asking, do they have the right to ask for brand Y? Um, so like, is there a, a choice? Like we, we hear kind of officially that all those who are in such and such a cohort will be getting brand X. If somebody has a big issue with brand X, can they ask for brand Y? Good question. I, I don't know the answer to that because I think at the minute what's available, when I went to get my booster before Christmas, um, I wasn't sure if there was going to be a discussion in the vaccine center about what the options were and which I was going to go for. But of course, they're all they were all adapted vaccines that day and they're now just all adapted vaccines. So they're all these bivalent vaccines which have um, uh, antigens from both the um, one of the original strains and from the Omicron BA5 or one of the other Omicron variants. So um, I think what would in reality happen if you were to go in expecting to have a discussion is that you would be turned away and, and there would have to be some bespoke response. I don't know. I might have to take that away and, and find out mm. what the options are. I, I, I think there won't, won't be options. I think it's and I think I, my sense is from what I've heard colleagues from the National Immunization Office say is that, I mean, of course, there's always a, there's always a, there's always the opportunity to talk about these things when you've had a reaction to something. But I think if um, uh, the, the general principle is at the minute that a vaccine, any vaccine is better than no vaccine. So get the vaccine you're offered, uh, take the vaccine you're offered because that is better than not having a vaccine. 
Um, but I might have to take that away and come back, Colin, with um, that, uh, what, what are the bespoke options available to people who have had reactions? I think the reality is that that won't be about people just feeling a bit achy or fluey or unwell. I think it will have to be people who have, you know, reaction, you know, formal described reactions to um, a vaccine, which is very different. Um, now, you, you mentioned the um, kind of the newer vaccine, the I think they call it the bivalent vaccine. Yeah. Um, in relation to the XBB 1.5, the variant that's running around America as we speak and is expected over this side soon enough, um, is it more effective? Like, is, is it having an impact on XBB? Like, is it a good thing to put yourself forward to get this now in, in anticipation of XBB coming? Well, I looked this up because I was primed that this might be a common question. And, and in fact, it came up with yesterday at the stakeholders meeting to a discussion uh, forum to ECDC have issued a, 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 an advisory note that there's no effect, vaccine effectiveness data estimates for XBB 1.5. Um, uh, but that it remain the, the vaccine remains effective against the current dominant strains of Omicron. Uh, against severe disease. However, I had a rummage and I found that there's a, a, a note from the US, where as you've mentioned, that's where they're seeing a lot of this XBB 1.5. And they have a note, the CDC have a note saying that um, bivalent mRNA booster doses provide additional protection against symptomatic infection with XBB 1.5 for at least three months after vaccination in people who've had previous vaccinations. So that sounds to me like good news. You, it affords you at least an additional three months um, uh, protection. And as it's stated, it says against symptomatic infection. Um, typically what it said is that it provides protection against severe disease and hospitalization. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's an additional benefit that it has or I haven't seen it described in that way before as additional protection against symptomatic infection. So I think, again, that feels to me like Yes, you should, these would be good things to get uh, before this becomes the dominant variant as it's expected to uh, in Ireland. It's not yet. It's only about 6% of those been, that have been um, have undergone sequencing in the last couple of weeks. Um, but it's likely and expected to become the dominant variant um, over the course of the spring and into summer. Thank you. That's a good answer. Um... Right, you're being worked up on the transplant pool and you have a chance of getting listed. The talk we heard during the pandemic was you have to have be up to date on all your vaccines before you would be transplanted. Does that is that going to delay me getting listed for a transplant? Like let's say I had COVID three months ago, so I, I'm not yet able to get the next uh, booster. Um, am I going to be delayed in my listing and delayed in my transplant? No, uh, again, not working in the transplant centre. But my understanding talking to the transplant team is that they want to know what, what your vaccine status was, not that it's going to make any, any impact on whether or not you get your transplant or not. They want to know where you were, what they need to do. Was there any additional precautions they need to be they need to take? They want, you know, they want to know, had you recently got COVID? You know, were you still infectious? Um, but there was never an, an indication to me to, about any of my patients um, that anybody would be not allowed to get on the transplant list because they weren't vaccinated. Neither were they being suspended because their vaccines were out of date. This was not a request to see how you were and you're not getting it if you're a COVID denier or you're somebody who doesn't believe in COVID and didn't get any vaccinations. That did not interfere with the decision process. What they did want to know was what was your vulnerability to COVID-19 um, so that when they were managing you in the post-op period, they could take the appropriate precautions. Grant, um, how do I know if I have long COVID? Um, that's a... <laughs> that, that I'm not just run down or perhaps um, my transplant is failing. Like, how, how, how do I know? How, how do I flag it? Or, or what should I be looking out for? Okay. Um, I know Emer can talk about it and we'll talk about it as well. But, you know, 
from our our experience is that um, you know firstly there's no test and there's no test in terms of transplantation or anything like that it is you know and i think there's different patterns of long COVID. There's different variations that affects different peoples in different ways. Um, you know, I don't think with the, an internationally agreed version of what is long COVID. What we do know is that COVID infection causes damage to specific organs and it can affect in different ways. It's people with pre-existing organ damage may experience additional organ damage. It can reactivate so much immune diseases. But to say there's a disease called long COVID that has, you, you do a blood test and it comes up like rheumatoid arthritis, there isn't anything like that. And, um, you know, it can cause damage to the kidney. And we often see people who had COVID, even some people who didn't said, I wasn't sick with it, but you see the GFR has dropped. Um, that can happen. Those people can have severe COVID and you think everything's going to go bad. And they come out and they're like rubber and everything goes back to normal. And you're saying, how did you manage that? So, Emer, do you want to say anything? Would you? Yeah, I, was, I would have said similar things. And then the other thing I suppose is because of that variation in what the post-COVID, post-acute COVID symptoms are or might be, and because of the huge variation in their duration, uh, uh, I think it's also worth saying that having the label long COVID doesn't actually confer any benefit because there isn't a specific treatment either. So I think the important thing is to uh, for for this for this audience is to keep in touch with your physician and um, you know keep describing the symptoms that you have and it may be that they are something that can be um, described and managed without necessarily being attributed to COVID or it may be that they end up being not attributed to anything else and they could be long-lasting post-acute COVID symptoms. But as I say, it's not a single entity, as Georgia said, it's not a single entity, uh, and it's it's worth keeping the conversation going. Um, I'm not sure this is a particularly helpful um, label at the minute because we don't really know what it means uh, or how to manage it, really. But there is an increasing interest in studying it. And as, as you said, George, there, there are some very definite long-term, longer-term consequences with very specific effects that need specific management. But that's not to say that's true of everybody who's still very tired four or six months later after their COVID infection. Now, for a very grey area that there's been a lot of questions raised in this country and, and in many other countries, I've been on plenty of patient and medical webinars in relation to it, is um, we know that people on dialysis and transplant recipients are likely not to show the same level of response to um, the vaccines, um, but measuring it. Like, I keep getting these vaccines, but is it having any impact? Like, is there a test to determine that, yeah, I'm doing pretty okay in terms of my uh, protection against COVID or I'm not doing so good? Um. I could do some general comments and then I mean I'm not an immunologist so I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly the detail of this but it's my understanding that there isn't a single test that tells you you can certainly measure antibodies to the spike proteins and you can certainly get a number as a result of that and I suppose the truth is we don't really know what the number means at a population level and we don't really know what it means in an individual and I would have thought its interpretation needs particular care in a population who have other immunocompromising, albeit perhaps not as immunocompromising as some people say. But in other words, you can certainly do a test and get a number, but what that means is harder. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, we are seeing increasingly publications about um, the different levels of antibodies. It, at a population level. So for example, there are zero uh, epidemiology studies, including in Ireland. Um, so all blood, blood donors, for example, have their antibodies against spike proteins of COVID measured, and that can be followed over time. And it can be seen that there's um, significant uh, immunity. Well, there's significant detectable antibody levels yeah. in at a population level. But what that means is, as I read the literature, difficult to interpret at an individual level. Yeah, I think if I understand correctly, like antibodies are not the be all and end all, like it's T cells and, and so forth are, are, are important as well. Correct. Yeah. 
and I think that th therein lies the problem, Colin. You uh, is that you know antibodies tell you that you you can make antibodies, but to kill viruses, you need a different mechanism, and it's a surrogate marker, and it's not not always the same. Like we see some, you know, we renal patients never follow the rule books. That's one. That's one of the things. I always say, like, you know, people who've got high cholesterol on dialysis do better than people with low cholesterol, people who've got high blood pressure. Like, kidney patients never seem to follow what the everyone else does. And never. So I, we don't know what having antibody levels mean on an individual patient. I wouldn't, I think, I wouldn't rely on them. I, they're not, they're not um, a shield. Having a high level is not a shield. It doesn't stop you doing the basics. And that's why I don't think there's any point. It might give you a false sense of security. The thing is to do, be cautious, be careful, you know, do what we do. I'm still wearing masks. I eat my lunch usually on my own a lot of the time. You know, when I'm going, on the, when I'm going into on the Lewis, I will put on my mask going in on the Lewis. I mean, if I'm nipping into the shop to get a pint of milk, I probably won't put on my mask. I'm sorry about that. But if I'm going shopping for a while, I will. You know, if I'm going around say um, a department store for a few hours. Yes, if I go on the plane, I put on a mask. So it's being careful. Um, we have a question in the chat function that's come through to myself here. Um, in the Journal of Infection Diseases, um, there was uh, a paper on uh, hyperimmune globulin as a COVID treatment for immune uh, suppressed patients. Uh, who have no available um, kind of monoclonals. Is this kind of a suitable treatment? Is it an, an available treatment? Um, what, what? It's, not, it's not a surprise that it's being studied because I suppose it's been studied before in many other diseases. The idea being that you get the immunoglobulin of people who've recovered from the particular condition, you perhaps pool it, so you get that from a number of people, and you consider whether that might be an appropriate treatment. So the concept seems something that's been done before, but it's certainly not, to my knowledge, available. Uh, I don't believe it's been evaluated. Well, I know it's not been evaluated here. Whether it's been evaluated elsewhere, I haven't read the paper, apologies. Um, so yeah, not, not available right now. And I and I I did a literature search before this in case I got asked some awkward questions, <laughs> and I can tell you I none of my colleagues and we've never used it, and it's not something on our you know it's not something there, uh, you know. So I think there's a lot of treatments, you know what I mean, out there. Drink bleach. <laughs> <laughs> Turn orange if you do that. Um, Please right. don't drink bleach. <laughs> <laughs> That's sorry. That was a joke, by the way. Just clarify. <laughs> Um, people living with vulnerable people like throughout the pandemic they never really got priority in terms of being vaccinated or getting extra boosters it's still a question that we're seeing from time to time that like why why are we wrapping the individuals who may not have a great um response like we're wrapping them in cotton wool but we're not wrapping the people around them in cotton wool That's you, Reamer. It is, is that about vaccinating, prioritizing them for vaccination, for example? Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure this has been advocated for by people who advocate to NIAC for consideration, but um, I guess it's really, it, yeah, it sounds like it makes sense, but it probably doesn't make sense as a, well, to NIAC to make that as a general recommendation, but it, it makes sense to me. I suppose over time, I, I don't know what is next for vaccination. Um, I see in the US they're talking about moving to a, a seasonal vaccination um, in the way that we do with, or we recommend for flu. Um, but I also see debate about whether, whether that's required and whether it might be just that the seasonality would be for again, high risk populations, for example, this audience and perhaps their carers or their you know, people around them. Um, so I think that's all up for debate. Um, so yeah, I can't give a better answer than that because I'm not in NIAC, apologies. Well, that's a good answer. Grant, I think we've kind of come to a, a bit of a natural conclusion to uh, a variety of questions. And thank you both very much for um, your, 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 your detailed and considered responses. 
Um, so I'd like to hand back to Carol now, um, who will kind of take on the, the next stage. Okay, great. So again, I'd like uh, to thank you both George and Emer uh, for giving so much of your time and taking all our questions so seriously. And I can see from the uh, people who've had to leave that they're all saying it's been very informative and very helpful. So uh, thanks very much for that. The next section, which you're very welcome to stay on for, is a very quick update on the on the um, human tissue bill with regard to transplantation. It was in the drawing on Tuesday. And then we'll do... Um, what we always do at these things is we get your feedback and how useful you found the survey and then we'll have a few words from our national chairperson Eddie Flood so you're very welcome to stay for that or if you want to leave and go have your dinner you're obviously we won't take insult of that either so we leave it up to yourselves uh, so thank you very much indeed um thank you thank you George and thank you Emer very much Carl thank thank you thank you very much and it was very helpful and um look we, we you know look forward doing more for the renal community over the coming year. So Perfect. all the very best. I'll Thank be in touch. Bye. Great. Okay. Thank Bye. you very much. Great. So on the human tissue bill, many of you will be aware that it was actually uh, brought to what's called the second stage in the doll um, on Tuesday night. And there was a very long debate. It was welcomed by all parties. What was very interesting was with the exception of one TD, all TDs spoke in favour of the opt-out only clause, and there were some very considered questions around it. So it was generally acceptable um, to parties. A number of the amendments that were suggested were actually based on um, a case that we put forward. We made a submission um, to all members of the Health Committee and a number of other TDs that we knew were interested. So any of you have saw it will have seen that the IPA got referenced quite a number of times in terms of the work that we were doing, uh, advocating um, for organ donor awareness and change in the legislation. So um, the next stage is the bill will actually go back to the committee. The ministers indicated that um, they will accept amendments um, to the bill. I actually had a call from a special advisor in the minister's office to discuss it and we put forward our view very strongly. We do welcome the bill because it is replacing very outdated legislation. Um, it's taking up a lot of time and effort. Um, we all know that nothing will change unless a lot of additional resources are put into it. But one of the key things we do want to see change in the bill is that there was actual publication of detailed organ donation and transplant st statistics right down at hospital level. They do this in other countries. And if we get that in, that will actually drive change because we'll be able to see what exactly is going on at hospital level. Is every potential donor family actually be given the opportunity to donate? Are they being asked? And there's a pilot of that going on at the moment that's called a potential donor order. So the, the, the structures are there. And we want to see it in the legislation because that means it has to be publicised. And we also want to see deceased donors being represented on the independent panel. Um, so we will uh, be preparing some briefing material on that. Um, and we'll be getting that out to you hopefully within the next six weeks. Uh, we're trying to find out the timing of the next stage of the bill going to the Health Committee. And we would hope we'd be called before the Health Committee to actually advocate um. Uh, you know, on your behalf on this bill. Obviously, our preference is for opt-in, opt-out. We don't think we're going to succeed on that, in fairness, because we're the only body that's advocating for that. Uh, but hopefully we can get some other changes through that will make, we believe, will make a huge difference and hopefully um, start progressing. And it will just be a first step towards progressing um, the reduction of um, the waiting list. So that's the, the human tissues bill. Um, if there's any questions on that, just quickly put them into the chat function. And I'm going to ask Colin, assuming the technology is going to work, that he would launch the feedback poll. This is very important for us because it tells us, are you finding these sessions useful? Because obviously we only want to do them if you find them useful. And if you don't find them useful, we'll have to find some other way of uh, communicating. And then after that feedback poll is launched, our national chairperson, Eddie Flood, will say a few words. So hopefully, Colin, you're in a position to launch the poll if the technology is working. We do never know until it happens whether the poll is actually going to work. And I can see by Colin's face, he's it's, having it's, it's, cur it's currently underway. Um, yeah, okay, you should start seeing it on your screen have, shortly. Um, 18, 19 responses out of 26 people on, on the call. So um, 
just need a few more people to give okay. us a click there. 20 out of 26, six to go. Uh, we seem to be uh, 20 out of 20 if we've, we've got answered. Um, so we've got 14 out of 20 or 70% saying it was very helpful and 6 out of 20 or 30% saying it was helpful. So, um, yeah, it's a yep. positive response. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you all very much for that. And again, if you ever have any feedback about how we can make these more useful and more informative or topics that you like, um, covered by all means email us um the main email is info info at ika.ie so we're always very interested in hearing from you so i'm going to hand over to our national chairperson now eddie flood who is as you know himself a transplant patient so eddie would you like to close this session well carol thanks very much um i think we had 38 people tonight on zoom which is a, a great amount of people i'm sorry my camera's gone haywire again um I'd like to thank Professor Malott and Dr. Emer Brannigan for helping us out and for answering all those tough questions. And uh, thanks to Colin for asking those questions, uh, which uh, he had to he had to dig in deep there to get them. And um, fair play to him. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the the the, uh, the session and found it very informative. So I'll say no more and just say good night and thank you for for joining us. Brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. So that's it, folks. Thanks very much, guys. That was brilliant. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye, folks. Thank you all very much.